Okay, we're going to get started. I have a couple important announcements. Uh, if you've been watching the screen, there's some late breaking news. The BPF backend of GCC has been checked into the trunk. Isn't that exciting? We, like, like hell have frozen over. Uh, another announcement important for the conference, uh, speakers. You want to get your speaker's gift, please go to the registration table. They have it in a box. Just ask for it, and they will give it to you. Okay, so if you want your speaker's gift, go to the registration table. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have a talk about uh, a project that's kind of... Uh, we've been waiting for, to happen for quite some time, in fact. Uh, it's the upstreaming of the MPTCP implementation. Uh, so, it, but it looks like we're on the right track right now, and we'll get all kinds of information about that from Matt and Matteo. Okay, so please give a round of applause for these gentlemen. Great, so welcome to this presentation. So, uh, as Dave mentioned, so we are Matt Martineau from Intel, and uh, I'm Mathieu Bars from uh, Tessares, a small company from Belgium. And we are representing here a community of uh, developers, so not everybody can uh, come with us on the stage. Uh, but we have uh, Peter Christad from uh, Intel also, who is in the audience, but uh, also from home. We have uh, Osama Otman, Christoph Barge from Apple. Uh, we have Paolo Abini, uh, Davide Carati, and Florian Westphal from Red Hat. So we are going to talk about the progress that we have made uh, over the last few months to upstream multipass TCP to the Linux kernel. We will also ask you some questions to know if we are going on the right direction. So of course, please interrupt us if you have any question or solution for our issues. So during this presentation, we will introduce you to multipass TCP. We will also go into details for what will be in our initial patch set, then we will uh, talk about what will arrive next before the short conclusion. So we have to start with that. What is multipass TCP? So just to know how fast I can go for the following slide, uh, may I ask you to ra raise your hand if you don't know anything about multipass TCP? Okay. And for you, all of you, do you plan to sleep in the ne next 45 minutes? Okay, nobody raised their hand. Um, also, just to know, uh, is there many people that know also a bit about multipass TCP? And some people that know a lot about multipass TCP? Oh, do you want to present here? <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, great, so uh, multipass TCP, in one sentence, uh, it allows to exchange data for a single connection over different paths simultaneously. So it is break breaking the assumption that one connection is restricted to the same five tuple. So behind the RFC, you can find a description of this protocol published in 2013. So it is supported by the ITF Multipass TCP Working Group. Um, a typical representation of what the protocol can bring is represented on the slide. So on one hand, you have a phone or any device that can be connected to different networks. It can also have different multi, uh, network interfaces to di directly to this network, and then you have a server on the other side that have fast access from many different networks. So with this setup, you can have more bandwidth, of course. Uh, you can also have more redundancy if you wish, uh, but you can also support some handover or mi mobility use cases. So a typical scenario is the walkout one. So imagine that you are inside a building, uh, you are going out of the, building, of the building, and the Wi-Fi signal is getting weaker and weaker. But that's not an issue because you have multipass TCP, the connection can continue on the cellular network. So this is useful, knowing how hard it can be to detect a disconnection on the wireless network. And also, you don't have to restart a new connection, connection and restart from where you were before. Uh, the switch also can be fast between uh, the two net networks. So different vendors have added multipass TCP support. So 
Apple was mainly the first one uh, since 2013, if I remember well, uh, mainly to support failover and this kind of walkout scenario. Uh, some other vendors also implemented it, uh, also to have more bandwidth, especially in some countries like Korea, uh, South Korea, of course. Um, there is also another use case that I like to present uh, because it's the one that we are working on at Tessares. Uh, it's about the residential gateway. So we can have hybrid re residential gateway, router at home, uh, where we can combine both LT and DSL network. It's very useful, especially when you are far away from a street cabinet and your DSL connection is shit. Um, Another very important use case is, uh, is that multipass TCP is part of the 5G standardization. Uh, it is part of the ATSSS function, for, which means access steering, uh, access traffic steering, switching and splitting. A very nice word, uh, but basically to show that. So uh, what it means is that uh, to improve the end user experience, uh, you can have some steering, so you can select the best, best network uh, 5G, Wi-Fi, or 4G, especially if 5G is not available everywhere. Uh, you can have seamless handover, so switch from one network to another. And you can also have network aggregation if the operator want to give you more bandwidth. Um, great. Um, it is part of the 5G, but it is not, uh, there is no implementation in the Linux upstream kernel. But the 3GPP guys, they have selected multipass TCP because it's a major protocol. Um, an implementation exists out of three uh, since March 2009. Uh, it's not new, uh, the last version is V95, and it is generally used as a client server in current deployment. So currently it's used by millions of users. But the problem is that it's not upstreamable. Uh, it's not upstreamable mainly because it has been built to support experiment and rapid changes, but not generic enough. Uh, most of the users that install this kernel want to use multipass TCP. So it is fine for them if other TCP connections are slightly affected. I mean, consuming a bit more CPU cycle and a bit more memory. So to have multipass TCP upstream, uh, a group of developers that we represent have defined some guidelines. So we have a new implementation. Um, the guidelines say that the new implementation cannot affect the existing TCP stack. Uh, we don't want any performance regression in TCP stacks, of course. We don't want any code change if uh, config MPTCP is disabled. What we also want is to have something easy to maintain uh, also configurable. Uh, we don't want to have many if statements in the TCP code. Uh, and what we also want is to have is to have an implementation that can be used in variety of deployment. One guideline that we have fixed is that multipass TCP will be opt-in. Uh, I mean that uh, if you are a developer, uh, an application a developer of applications. Uh, if you want to have multipass TCP, you will need to ask for it. Uh, of course, there will be workaround for that. Matt will talk about that later. Uh, what we will also like to do is to proceed in steps. So minimal feature set first, and then the optimization and the advanced feature for later. So now let's talk a bit about um, the protocol. Uh, we need to detail a bit because there are some notions that are very particular to MPTCP. Um, so first, creating a new protocol these days uh, in a world full of very nice middle boxes in a, it's not easy. Either you go um, and you take the quick way, I mean, you encrypt everything, you do that on top of UDP, so you do quick, or you work with what is available in TCP. Uh, so MPTCP is an extension to TCP. The different connections composing an MPTCP1 are called TCP subflows. Uh, in fact, there are TCP connections on the wire. So they contain specific TCP, TCP options. They also behave like TCP, so you still have SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and whatever. 
So what is also important and what the protocol would like to have is that the, the usage would be similar, similar for the application. So if an application was using TCP previously, it should continue to do the same to use multipass TCP, except of course it, if it wants to have some fine grain control. Uh, one important notion in MPTCP world is uh, the data sequence number. So to be able to reconstruct a stream sent over multiple subflow, you need a dedicated data sequence number. Uh, this is in addition to the TCP one, because you need something at the MPTCP layer. I didn't do anything, I swear. Um, so this is the DSS. So it is something needed. Uh, but also when we look at that uh, from a stack point of view, when a, an application sends data, data to the kernel, MPTCP will select, of course, the subflow. But then the subflow, we also need to know what need to be uh, in the TCP option. So you will need to add some specific MPTCP option in the TCP header. So you can see that the layers are not clearly separated. Uh, in fact, this major TCP extension overlapped so much with the regular TCP. Um, just also a quick note is that like TCP, if you have a sequence number, you also need ACK to ensure delivery. Um, then there are also some keywords that are really specific to MPTCP. Um, so we have a few examples here. So we have the MPK table and the MP drone. They are both visible on the TCP SYN packet. Uh, one is to announce, of course, that uh, we can do multipass TCP and we would like to initiate a new one. Uh, the other one is to join a new TCP subflow to an existing MPTCP connection. Uh, we will also talk a bit about uh, data fin later, uh, but that simply corresponds to the TCP uh, fin, but for the MPTCP layer. Uh, also important to uh, say is the signaling, because MPTCP needs some signaling. Uh, it is done via dedicated TCP ACK, and it is used to announce, for example, additional addresses to the other host, so I'm available from this IP. Uh, it can also uh, be used to cancel an announcement that has been done. Uh, we also have the fast close because maybe at some point you want to free resources as quickly as possible. And you use what we call a fast close. Uh, a last bit which is worth mentioning uh, because it will impact TCP code is that the receive windows across uh, the TCP subflow is shared. Um, it is forced by the protocol to avoid deadlocks. Uh, we cannot change the protocol. There is a very good reason that it is there, and we will need to implement it. But Matt will talk about that later. So last slide before talking about what will be in our initial patch set. Uh, it's just a small note about uh, the different version that exists uh, for multipass TCP. So there are mainly, and there are in fact two uh, versions now av available. So you have the current RFC 6824 and its evolution that has been submitted for publication. Uh, unfortunately, or not, but uh, there are some behavioral changes. So we will switch from V0 to V1. Uh, but what is important is that um, it is somehow better. Uh, it is better not only because my boss was leading the discussion, but also because it has been written uh, after having received some feedback from the different users and the different implementers. So in short, it should be easier to implement for some points. Uh, it will also allow a few more use cases, uh, but also because it has been selected by the 3GPP organization for 5G, and we hope that uh, all existing implementation will quickly switch to this new version. Uh, we would like to ask you a question, is that, is it okay if we only focus on the new RFC uh, 6824-bis, or the new standard one? to avoid having some ugly code in, the, in MPTCP, especially when we'll, we'll have to handle the different MPTCP option. Mm. 
I think it's okay if you fo focus just on V1. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, great. Uh, finally, we can now discuss about what will be in your first patch set um, that we will send soon, we hope. Um, so our first RFC version has been shared on the Netlink mailing list in June, I think. But we will describe here what was already in it, what is in our development version, and what will be in the next few weeks. So to understand the following slides, uh, here is the global architecture for MPCP, the one that we have selected. Uh, the different items will, of course, be detailed later. But just try to keep in mind this picture that might be useful for later. So the application will talk to MPTCP layer through the socket API. Uh, MPTCP layer is, in fact, IP proto. Uh, then we have below the TCP subflows. They are built on top of TCP ULP framework. Uh, we will detail, detail that later. Uh, and also remember that we will, we will have to store some specific MPTCP data uh, this is done by using SKB extension, so to only store data for the MPTCP connection and not for all connections. Okay, if there is no question about that, let's continue. Um, so, how application can create MPTCP socket? So, what we decided is to do that via the socket API. So like TCP, you can see that we have uh, SOC stream, argument is still there. Uh, we also have AFINET or AFINET6, uh, which lead me to a question that we also have is that uh, for the moment, uh, IPv6, IPv6 is currently not supported by our uh, implementation. It should not be hard to add, uh, but we would like to f not focus on that for the beginning. I agree, but it's a bit later. It's a bit too late. Uh, no, in, indeed, maybe we should have started with that. Uh, but the, the question is that uh, we would like to push our patch. Uh, we would like also to have some feedback about that, and we would like to know if we can continue like that. Of course, IPv6 will be on the top of our uh, to-do list for later, but would it be OK for upstream if we do that? If we turn the box on, I, uh, I think that the upstreaming approach should be you should you should be submitting the most basic MPTCP functionality at the beginning. Therefore, you should be having IPv6 support from the start as well in these simplistic, basic MPTCP implementations that were way past the point of letting people submit IPv4 specific implementations of anything anymore. We just can't allow that anymore. It's just not practical. People have. People's entire data centers are IPv6 enabled at this point. So I, I think you need to add IPv6 support as a requirement. Thank you. <laughs> Not to answer a question with a question, but what's the hesitation from implementing this on IPv6? It doesn't seem like it should be have any particular extra difficulty. No, it should not be difficult. It's just that we focus on IPv4 for the moment. Some structure are only using a U32, for example, to store addresses. It's just that we don't want to start by added unions and, and others. I, but if we I have would agree with Dave, then, given that your, your first primary example was the use of a cell phone over multiple networks and they're primary users of IPv6, it would make sense to add that first. I can guarantee we will not take it for Android without IPv6 support. Anyone else want to continue in this fantastic discussion? <laughs> OK, please continue. Um, great. Um, OK, so if we come back to the line that is uh, written on the slide, we also have at the end IP proto MPTCP. So of course, behind that, there is a number. Uh, the number that we have picked is 262, not because it's pretty, but uh, because we had some constraint there. Um, on the wire, of course, we will only see 
uh, IP proto TCP because on the wire you will not see a special number for the protocol there. Um, but internally we need a new number. Uh, INA, they are responsible of assigning the assigning A bits, so up to 256, but we need a new one. Uh, we don't really want to spend time at INA to ask them for a new number, except if you know some shortcut for that. But um, <laughs> what we have picked is that we, we took uh, IP proto and then we added uh, 0x100. Like that, we hope that it should be fine because the number should not be too high after 255, which is the last number currently used. Uh, we, of course, che check that in the kernel it is fine to use this number. We had to change two or three lines, I think, just to print the correct information, but it was just for debugging. Uh, but we are wondering if you see any other issue that we could have with that. For example, Lipsy, they also redefine all these numbers. Uh, in theory, for the socket API, you need an integ integer for the last bit, so it's fine. Uh, but if you have anything to say about that, don't hesitate. We will continue to do that then. Um, OK, uh, now about uh, how you can interact with the current socket that you have just created. So. As an application developer, what you want to do sometime is to tune uh, how your MPTCP socket will behave. But it can be on the global MPTCP socket, uh, but it could be also only for the subflow, only for the existing and future subflow, or maybe only for one specific subflow that you have on your MPTCP connection. Um, this can be either complex to implement or not easy to read at the beginning. So what we want to do is not to settle on an API, no. So all you can do is to interact with the MPTCP circuit if there is no subflow, and we will see what we will do later. Any objection for that? Good. Um, now an important topic. It's about security. Uh, of course, we will do our best to avoid an issue, uh, but it's clear that the initial implementation will not be hardened by broad use yet. So you will not have many companies running a syscaller with config MPTCP equal to yes. Uh, so what we would like to do is not allow any application to create MPTCP socket. So the idea that we have and we already implemented is to have a CCTL per network namespace. So by default, no application will be able to create any MPTP socket. If an admin turn on the option, then any application from this network namespace will be able to create uh, an MPTP socket. Uh, is it enough? I think it might be over engineering to turn it off by default even. If we're going to accept your code, it should be functional and we should be able to trust it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have to trust ourselves first. But. That's right. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's a good news. Uh, should we keep yep. this option, this CCTL? Oh. I, th I think we already have too many knobs in the, in the tree. <laughs> I think it could be uh, good to have this knob, but turn the opposite way. Yeah, to uh, turn it off if off. there is an issue. Yeah, in yes. case of emergency, but I think it's a minor detail. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. And the other thing for the syscaller, you should just submit a patch that it, I mean, like the, the, the model that is needed to, to extend the API that syscaller understands, and then it will also fuss MPTCP, right? So it's not like a big thing. Yes, thank you. Watch your head. Uh, I just wanted to point out that per name, per network namespace, syscitals are not a security protection of any sort because with uh, unprivileged namespaces, uh, unprivileged user namespaces, anybody can create a network namespace and anybody can set the syscital to enabled. So if there's any sort of kernel exploit, uh, anybody can exploit it. 
I, since you have them both on the same slide here, I'd also make the argument that if you do have a, a sys control that enables or, or disables MP TCP globally by an administrative interface, I'd make the argument that specifying a different uh, IP protocol as MP TCP might be less than ideal because your programming model would then create an environment where your socket call would fail as opposed to a socket option that would fail, the latter being potentially recoverable by an application where the former would not. On the other hand, we do have uh, C group hooks for our uh, socket creation, and it's pretty easy to turn stuff off just by causing those to fail. Yeah, like an LSM. Um, yeah. Uh, another thing is if this is a module, you may want to prevent it from auto loading based on somebody just asking for it. That might be a sufficient protection. I mm -hmm. also understand that there's an SC Linux hook for blocking stuff like that too. Like we could get them at the at SC Linux hook as well. So C groups, SC Linux, there are a lot of ways to turn this thing off other than a syscontrol. And as he mentioned, a per net namespace syscontrol is like a NOP. It could be undone by anyone, so. Good, thank you for. Uh, uh, from the security point of view, I think I'm, I'm not concerned of users actually creating the sockets. And as people just mentioned, there are a bunch of different ways to like switch it off, LSM, whatnot. I'm more concerned what the receive pass inside the kernel will do, whether there will be like any, I don't know, infinite loop just parsing this TCP options and so on. So there, to turn that part of emergencies, this need to be like carefully thought through. Like we had bugs in flow detector, for example, and this is changing TCP stack. So, so this part of it, like for remote packet of this type of attacks from PTCP, that would be more concerning than user space using this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's also because some um, multipass TCP is known uh, also because on Apple there was a security issue where the people were able to uh, jailbreak the uh, phone by using MPTCP socket. So we would like not to have the same there because we would like to have MPTCP famous for other things, but, uh, but th that's a good point that we, we need to check, it, to check that. Thank you. Uh, so to summarize, I think that because of the C group SC Linux angle, it actually does make sense to have this separate socket number, protocol number. Okay, and then Alexi's point about making sure the receive path is very strictly audited. Thank you. All right, good, let's move on. Um, so because MPTCP is big and complex, it is important to use the debugging. So uh, MPTCP will have a collection of counters for diagnostic and debug purposes because it's easy to retrieve. Uh, but the per socket data will be shared via, uh, with user space via SOC DIAG. Um, what we already did is that we extended TCP ULP framework to enable DIAG for them. Uh, but we also have another question here. Um, MPTP is really close to TCP. And as you all know, there are already some counters that can be found in PropNet TCP. Uh, we just want to know if we also have to go in that direction to create a new PropNet MPTP that can maybe be useful for embedded devices. We don't know. What would be, what's your view, view about that? was discussed on native uh, last week by Florian. Oh. So I think Florian already asked this question. So you okay. Can... Uh, but I think the, the question that he had was more about the, the MIP counters, uh, where we could extend netstat, for example. Uh, but here it's more to know, do we have to list all the connection, all the MPTCP connection like we can do with PropNet TCP? Oh, you mean the RTNet link interface, the SS? No, Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we don't want that, right? Cool. <laughs> Let's work for us. Thank you. You do, you do want SS to be able to find a good interface, though. Yes. 
Yes, and that's what we extended uh, in ULP. Uh, KTLS is already using it. Uh, just FYI, 15 more minutes. Okay, thank you. So let's quickly move on. Uh, the test, uh, we have some uh, kernel self-tests. Self they were easy to implement. Uh, we are te testing a bunch of things like uh, connection between different sockets, MPTCP to MPTCP. Then we check that the fallback is correctly working with MPTCP to TCP and the opposite. Uh, and we test that in various conditions, including packet losses, reordering, variation, network, in routing, and etc. cetera. Uh, but in, an important point is that we would like also to add MPTCP support to packet drill. Uh, it is more a background project. Uh, we are not active, actively working on that. But because packet drill is used to test most of the things related to TCP and others, uh, we would like to do the same with uh, MPTCP. Uh, also, just a note that uh, an existing out of three packet drill already exists with MPTCP support, like we have with the Linux kernel. Uh, but this is old, uh, based on an old version of packet drill and limited. So we need to work on that. But uh, if you don't know what to do this weekend, feel free. You can also have a look at that. Um, Matt? So in deciding what we want to support first, um, we took a look at the, the sort of the asymmetry in, in the code we need between supporting a, the server side of an MPTCP connection and uh, a device like a smartphone. Um, and what, you know, what we see is that in terms of the code, the, what you need to make the server side work is, is pretty much a subset of what you need on the client side. So um, on the client here, you've got that's where you have the multiple interfaces. That's where you need to make decisions about where am I, more difficult decisions about where do I send something, when do I choose to open a, uh, a new TCP subflow. And so since we have to implement all the server stuff first anyway, what, what makes sense to do is then upstream that, smaller set of code to review, get it out, get it in use, um, work on fixing things up. And um, and go from there. So, um, in terms of talking about what we plan to upstream, we also wanted to point out that we do have that, that uh, folks on our team have been upstreaming a few small things already. Um, the SKB extensions. Uh, what we needed in multipath TCP is that there there are the like the DSS mappings that are pretty closely coupled to the uh, the payload. And you know we just couldn't add everything we needed to struct SK buff because that would increase the size quite a bit. So um, Florian Westfall uh, added. So he took away the SP and NF bridge pointers out of struct SK buff, added one pointer back in with a with a couple of bits to say whether it's in use, and we uh, and that is able to be used um, for features that occasionally you know need to add something to the, the SKBuff structure, but doesn't need to be there all the time bloating the structure up. Um, and so this is suitable for things that, like us, don't fit there, but justify the extra overhead. But um, it's, it's also you know not the home for everything you ever dreamed of adding to SKBuff, but David wouldn't merge. <laughs> it's, you know, it's still a selective process to make sure that uh, it, it fits. Um, another thing we've upstreamed is the, um, like the SOC Diag support for SS to um, tie that into the ULP infrastructure so that we could use it and, and like KTLS could use it too. So um, as Matthew mentioned earlier, we, we've had the goal to you know, impact TCP as little as possible. This is a kind of current diff stat of uh, where our prototype touches the TCP stack. And the, the longer lines there are the places where we um, are parsing and writing TCP options. But um, other than that, it you know kept it pretty minimal. And what those changes are specifically, um, so in the ULP layer, so that, um, as part of KTLS getting merged, there's some generic infrastructure to say, uh, to set a TCP ULP option where you can insert an upper layer, ULP is upper layer protocol. You can do something on top of TCP within the kernel. And it's got a, a bunch of hooks that you know get called when they're needed, and um, 
since KTLS doesn't support listening sockets right now, um, we found this uh, race condition in when you're cloning a socket where sometimes the socket gets created and then gets deleted right away. Um, and so we just needed a hook to be able to not corrupt um, the I ICSK ULP data. Uh, it's funny that you're mentioning KTLS because I'm wondering if we can KTLS and PTCP sockets. I've got a slide on that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, beyond that, we um, exported I think TCP send MSS and TCP push because the MPTCP needs that level of control when sending, um, and TCP receive options need, need to be handed around. Um, we found, so when we're using uh, SKB extensions, um, if we allow those SKBs with extensions to be coalesced or collapsed, we lose our information we need. So just a little bit of logic to, to skip that for things with an MPTCP payload. Um, as I mentioned with the git diff stat, we have to parse those options, write those options. Um, we need a we need a flag in TCP SOC to say, hey, are you are you a, T a sub MPTCP subflow in order to support some of this changed behavior? Um, you know, TCP mini socks and minor changes, uh, uh, subflows when they're being joined to an existing connection, slightly different process. Um, when uh, SKB goes into TCP data queue to get reassembled and stuff, we need to check there and attach our SKB extension. Or um, for ACKS, so ACKS without payload can carry MPTCP options and of course, those don't get reassembled, so you gotta you gotta have a chance to look at that and do something with it. Um, TCP options received. Well, we've got a new variety of TCP options. We need to store those. And um, as Matthew mentioned, the t the subflow receive windows um, that's not in that diff stat yet because we haven't written that code yet. But um, basically, all those parallel TCP connections that are part of one, um, one MPTCP session, all of those advertise the same receive window together in order to prevent um, multipath TCP from taking over an unfair share of uh, the bandwidth. So, but that does mean you know we're maintaining that value differently. We're writing a different value into the TCP header. We need to have the code to do something different. <laughs> Um, so that is the scope of what we're thinking about for an initial merge, and uh, we have a few minutes left for um, the more advanced features that, that we see coming next um, to support things beyond the server use case because those, those are real important too. Um, so a couple pieces of terminology. Uh, one is this idea of a path manager in multipath TCP that is the uh, kind of component that decides we've got, we've got the ability to set up TCP connections over different interfaces. Which ones do we do? Which interfaces do we use? And when do we use them? And that's, that's the path manager's job. Um, so this, uh, we are defined a generic the Netlink API, have a user space daemon um, that can listen on that gets the MPTCP information about what peer interfaces are available, which IP addresses are available on the peer to connect to. Um, it knows what local interfaces are available and it can say, you know, create new subflows, disconnect subflows, that kind of thing. And it can also, you know, there's, there's, you can have all kinds of policy you can imagine for power situations or um, carriers having constraints and things like that. And so we just thought user space was a better place for that. So we have uh, been working on this in parallel with our kernel code. We have a, an MPTCBD project that's, uh, we have an alpha release up on GitHub at that URL. Uh, second piece of MPTCP specific functionality, a packet scheduler. So you have multiple subflows established. You need to think about Okay, each, each packet that's going out, each piece of data, where do I want it to go? Do I want it to go over cellular? Do I want it to go over Wi-Fi? Do I want it to go over the lowest latency, et cetera? Um, and so um, on the server side, um, as 
I had the previous illustration that showed like we kind of have one interface there. Um, it's a little simpler choice. We can kind of have a, a basic scheduler that um, pays attention to whether the other end, the peer has requested, okay, use, prefer this connection over another one. So, for example, um, it might set, it, there's this backup flag that gets signaled back and forth with multipath TCP and it can um, say only, only send something over cellular if there's no Wi-Fi connection, something like that. So um, this is something I think there's probably been like graduate student research papers on performance of different schedulers and things. Uh, the out of tree implementation uses kernel modules for this. Um, I don't, you know, EPBF, EBPF may be an option for um, allowing people to insert custom, like carrier specific requirements for scheduling and allowing them to, to configure that per connection or system-wide. Um, David kind of already covered the C group thing. Um, there's, there's attachment points for bind and connect already. There's not one on the socket call. Mm -hmm. So by adding one on the socket call, you, you could run applications in one C group, have those default to MPTCP, and that, you know, in addition to the kind of scenario of having a knob to turn, you could also, someone who wanted to run an existing binary could make things default to MPTCP that aren't doing it already. Um, yeah, we kind of touched on this one, running out of time. There's this interesting thing you can do with multipath TCP, this break before make scenario. You can have an MPTCP session with zero currently open subflows. There's, there's kind of a separate um, timeout at the MPTCP level. So it gives you a chance, like if you're trying to switch access points, your subflow can close without sending an MPTCP data fin that says close my MPTCP session. So the subflow goes away. You take your one WLAN, you switch access points, bring that back up, you got a new IP address, you establish a new subflow over that um, with that IP address. And um, I don't know, that's something we'd want to gauge demand for before uh, putting the work there. Um, kind of running out of time on um, socket options. There are, there are some different ways we could handle things, but I'm basically, there's a lot of them that would interfere with how MPTCP works, whether in option space or in the timing of when things get sent. So we feel like we need to be careful there. Probably whitelist certain options and let, let the MPTCP layer kind of mediate that and figure out what to do, what to skip. And uh, since David asked about kernel TLS. Um, so uh, as we mentioned before, you know, kernel TLS uses ULP. And an MPTCP socket is not a TCP socket. It doesn't have ULP. And even if it did, the hooks that you would insert at the MPTCP layer would need to do different stuff. Right. So we, you know, while we try to make uh, MPTCP socket work as much like a TCP socket as possible, it would, it would take extra work to do KTLS. And um, the things to think about with KTLS is that when you're sending on multiple subflows, that means like certain bytes from a TLS record might be on one interface and certain bytes might be on another. And that doesn't seem to play well with hardware acceleration. <laughs> and um, the other thing is that the DSS mappings that we're inserting in the TCP option headers assume that they have very specific knowledge of the sequence numbers of the data that's in that socket buffer and, and that get received on the other side. And so if you have a low level hardware accelerator inserting TLS record delimiters into the stream and crypto padding and messing with the sequence numbers, that that's not gonna work out all that well. So, um, you know, looking at it, if you do the, the software TLS yes, I know. up on the, uh, on the stream, the application stream before it gets touched by MPTCP and split across subflows, and accordingly, also on the receive side, you do the uh, reassembly and then feed that into the TLS infrastructure, then that, that seems workable. So, cool. Cool. so that is what we've got. Um, I think we're, we're out of time, time for time. questions, but. Yeah, um, I'll allow one question. Okay, she wins the lottery. 
So there have been a lot of uh, studies published uh, that show uh, MPTCP doesn't do well in, in cast-like scenarios where you have many-to-one communication patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, has I that issue been fixed already, or is it on the roadmap? I don't know. Do you, have, have you encountered that much, Matthew? Or? No. So, so. Uh, so these are called as in-cast issues where, let's say, for example, a server is receiving simultaneous lot of connections from different clients. In those, connection, uh, in those scenarios, MPTCP doesn't do so well because you have different subflows where, and each of the subflows are doing their own congestion control. Um, yeah, I think it's maybe better to talk sure. about that later because it might be linked to the current implementation. Yeah. I'm the degree to which I'm familiar with that, there are there has been research on MPTCP specific connection. Uh, sorry, um, congestion um, options for for the Linux kernel, but we we haven't talked about that being in scope yet. And, and I mean, there's there's a lot of things we couldn't get to on that advanced feature list, like zero copy and stuff like that. But it, you know, any anything that anyone's concerned about, you know, questions like that, we have our mailing list here, uh, mptcp at list.01.org, and you can find us and ask those questions. And uh, we also, the, the paper for this session is on the conference website with a, a bunch more details, too. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.